Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I am your host, Nick Nanavati, and we are joined by our guest here today, Robert Moreland. Robert, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. For those of you who don't know Robert, he is from the land down under, but not Australia, the Texas. He is from Texas. He has gone undefeated at the Warzone Houston Major Tournament with none other than the Astra Militarum. And Guard are a super exciting army right now. No one's really talking about them. Largely since the balance data slate, they've gotten nothing but points nerfs. On their indirect fire, a little bit of drops on their Gaunt's Ghost, which did make an appearance in today's list. But today we're going to get to know Robert Moreland in part one of this two-part show. We're going to get to know how did he design this guard army, what is his approach to Warhammer, what's his play style, and what's the what's that philosophy? How did he actually get this victory? And then over in part two, which will be for our subscribers, you can subscribe on AOW40K.com. That's where you can get all the good stuff. You can get access to our amazing Discord server and the second half of this episode where Robert gives his actual secrets, his tips, his tricks, and his tactics for how he moves his models and makes his strategies on the tabletop with this exact Astro Militarum list. Robert, how you doing? I'm living the dream every day. You're living the dream. Awesome. So tell me a bit about how you got into Warhammer. I want to get to know you a little bit. Sure. Well... Uh, I guess it's actually uh, kind of a, one of those sad but good stories. Uh, like back when I was in middle school, like uh, I had a buddy that played the Lord of the Rings game. And I remember going into a games workshop store, seeing the Imperial Guard, thought that was awesome. And I bought a box of Guardsmen. Fast forward probably about 15 years later, uh, I was helping my mom move some stuff in the attic. I just went through like a bad breakup and I was all like broken up by it and everything. Uh, all woe is me. And I found that little box of guardsmen that I bought like 15 years prior to that. And I was like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go and paint those up. I had zero desire to play the game. Didn't care about the lore. I just had a blast painting and assembling. And then uh, all of a sudden I found myself sitting there with like 3,000 points of guard and uh decided you know what maybe i should go ahead and give this game a shot and ever since then i guess it's just been pure uh like obsession i guess just love playing awesome man so basically you just you refound the hobby after just happening to to buy a box of guard and you got it and yeah. what, once you started playing, that's that's quite a journey, right? I've known you for a couple of years now, just knowing you passing through the Warhammer tournament circuits. But um, what's that journey been like? Because obviously that when you first start playing, after just painting a box of guard, you barely know how to play if that. And it's quite a journey to going undefeated at Super Majors. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll never forget going to my first little RTT and just getting my teeth kicked in. You know, and um, but pain retains, right? And especially as a guard player, um, you just get obliterated time and time again until you end up learning a lot of nuances of the game that you un- you kind of surprisingly end up catching on to. Like I know way more about the charge phase than I really should because it impacted me so much. You know, so um, yeah. Right. So you basically learn the game through playing the game. But I guess, how did you actually process? Like when you're when you're playing those games, you're obviously terrible when you're just first starting out. You're taking losses, mostly learning mechanics. And then from once you learn the mechanics, you translate into actually playing games and, and like thinking about it on a more strategic level. What was that process like for you? So uh, I actually had, I told this story to several people before. Uh, whenever I decided I'm going to take competitive play seriously and i was gonna try to do it with guard um back in eighth edition i tested every single regiment and every single unit and i lost 22 games in a row just playing things that i uh, objectively i'd look at and go that is bad right like it's way it costs too many points it doesn't do what i wanted to and then after throughout the course of all those losses i found out well you know what that unit actually has a really good niche scenario that actually helps me score points really effectively so um i just didn't kind of embrace the suck and just went hey look i'm gonna lose a whole lot 
but I'm going to become really familiar with this army. And, um, that's really tenacious. Like that is, I mean, I'm just going to play different data sheets in one guard or terrible, lose 22 times in a row, just keep going at it. Why, why are you so affiliated with guard? What well, was the whole draw there? So I've always loved the idea of just a regular dude like you or me and just holding the line and going against the worst stuff out there. Yeah, it's just very, it's always been very thematic to me and from a hobby perspective as well. You can just put a lot of different character uh, to all the models because they're just regular people. So what would a regular person do, right? Um, but it's really, I've always been drawn to the idea and how the guard functions on the tabletop. They've never had a whole bunch of tips, uh, a whole bunch of tricks. Um, the only tricks that the guard has access to are the tricks that you can come up with yourself. You know, but so. true. They're very, very, you know, as you said, like humanistic faction, right? Like they just they they play 40k like very fairly, you know. Um, yeah. no no rules outside the rules, pretty much. How does that actually allow you to express yourself as a player on the tabletop? What are some tricks when there are no tricks that you've come up with and used? So, you know, the guard, I mean, just like the lore, right? They just grind it out. So uh I often see a lot of people, especially with guard, they'll try to make an army, and this isn't just applicable to guard, uh, that just goes out there and tries to table their opponents as fast as possible. The way that I build lists is meant to ensure that it lasts till turn five, but I'm scoring points every single turn, right? So... It's just that long, slow grind. I'm not going to sit there, come out to get you. Uh, you're going to have to get me. Otherwise, I'm just going to score all the points. Yeah, so this kind of brings us into the next uh, like part I wanted to ask you about is really like your play style. Do you think this is like how you approach the game altogether, or is this just what you find effective for Astro Militarum? Uh, it is uh, how I approach the game altogether, even whenever I played Admech or uh, Custodes. Um, it's what what pieces allow you to score points and what pieces allow me to score points and what can I do to ensure that the things that score me points stay alive? Right? Yeah. So uh, if throughout the course of my games, uh, I charge probably every turn, right? Uh, because it ties people up. It makes people make decisions. Now they have to fall back. Maybe they need to do this. Now they can't do that action, right? So it's just constantly making people make decisions. And uh, that's how I try to design all my lists where if, if you don't do, if, if every single game plan in my deployment, I'm going to make you make a decision. If you come out and decide to shoot this, you will get shot by two other things, right? Uh, if you try to shoot this thing and it doesn't die, okay, then you're just dead, right? And so it's as, making my opponent make more and more decisions means they're more likely to mess up. Yeah, I mean, that's just like decision-making 101. Usually you don't hear guard armies or guard players talking like that just because the nature of your faction lends itself to being such a reactive, defensive, I'm going to sit here and shoot my guns and hopefully they die kind of thing. And it sounds to me like you have a much more proactive approach. So what does that look like on the tabletop? So, um, you know, I've... I've been doing really well recently, and I still have people tell me I'm building my list wrong because uh, I don't run artillery, uh, especially in 10th edition, and especially more so if you're running tactical missions. It's all about movement and board presence, so you can take advantage of all the different objectives as they come up. And the artillery, I honestly think, is a crutch. It can help you kill things, but in certain matchups, it can't even do that. And um, they just don't score you points. Uh, I totally but, agree with you and your assessment of like units that just sit there in the back and pummel people don't score you points. But, you know, you got to acknowledge that like there is something appealing about just sitting behind a wall and doing damage to somebody. You, the fact that it's not a feature of your, of your list at all is pretty striking to me. So you don't rate it as a tool. No, I really don't. Uh, like if I, if I need to slow down a big blob, I'm going to run a chimera up and charge you with it. Yeah. Right? Like they're only 70 points. So Very that's like 
I guess that translates to your whole style. You're pretty much playing tactical with your army and stuff. Yeah. And nice. then uh, if you choose to try to kill that Chimera, well, you, they're just tough enough that you need anti-tank, which means you're going to have to bring out your anti-tank. And then you're going to get blasted by a Dorn, a Storm Sword, and a Lehman Russ, you know? Yeah. Wow. So, and, and I guess you have all this extra more powerful firepower because you're not playing um, with that indirect fire. Guard or an army... I, I suppose this is your approach to all guard lists and like every every guard game you, you take now. So like guard are an army that are made of like tissue paper, right? Like they are so soft and flimsy, at least like traditionally. Mm. How are you just throwing yourself out there and expecting to live for five turns, right? That was something, as you said, is something your list is designed to do. I imagine if Chimera is just kind of running around the front lines, that's got to be dead. So it goes back to forcing my opponent to make decisions, right? If I just move my chimeras out there, yes, they 100% die easily. But now all of a sudden you have a toughness 13, 24 wound storm sword out there that does six plus D6 shots of ignore cover blast, strength 16, minus four, two plus D6 the damage. It's going to kill whatever it shoots at, right? And if you choose to make that decision to kill that chimera, you will anything that killed that only 70 point chimera will die. And nice. uh, so maybe you'll choose to shoot the storm sword. The engine seer gives it a, a four up in bolt. So even if you do manage to wound it, I'm still saving on a four up. Right. And so, it's, it's got uh, some, it's not easy to bring that thing down, you know, like very few armies can kind of kill that kind of thing, at least in one turn. Exactly. And, uh, so it's, it's, you basically, you, you use armored vehicles to get your opponent to commit their anti-tank so you can then pummel them. And your tanks are so tough that if they just go straight for your big tanks, um, they probably won't get it done anyway. Yeah, I mean, the toughness changes to vehicles have just been... It's, it's a massive boom to, uh, to guard, really. Especially guard. Because, so I mean, you've, been, just, you've been playing guard for years now, and this is obviously a, a totally different edition to last edition when in terms of, in terms of like player experience and what's good, what's bad, and all that. Yeah. Uh, were you able to play guard this style in previous editions, or is this something you've been able to find yourself with 10th edition? So it's a little different now. Uh, whenever, you know, we have the new codex for like a whopping three or four months, right? The, the codex ended up not liking it that much because artillery was still really good and you kind of had no choice but to bring it because you were wounding vehicles on threes and that's really hard to pass up um and then prior to that the eighth edition codex guard vehicles just died to a stiff breeze right so it was just it was a really uphill climb you had to play really surgically to do anything and just hope for the best Whenever you pop out, if you don't kill it, it's going to kill you, and it kind of is what it is. It is a real glass cannon army. Um, but now in 10, with the toughness changes, you can just have vehicles out there and say, look, if you don't kill this, I'm going to kill you. You cannot control the midboard. And with the big guns never tired, you can't just tag me either. It's fine. I'm going to kill you regardless. And uh, a lot of people just don't have the anti-tank necessary to kill enough. Yeah, no kidding. This is a very violent, aggressive strategy here. I thought you were going for some passive guard sit behind the walls thing. And then I opened up your list and I was like, wait, there's no artillery. Where's the basilisk? Where's the manacores? So oh, yeah, this, no. yeah. I mean it when I say I'm charging people almost every turn. Yeah, I, I, I have had uh, my storm sword in the game on my opponent's backfield objectives three times now. That is, like, I guess that's what happens after you table them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I think of guard as an army that's trying to press upon me, I feel like it's not very fast. It's not capable. It doesn't fly. You know, it, it has to move around terrain, not through terrain, except for the garbage infantry that get out of these things. So it seems very easily move blocked and stalled. Uh, especially on like modern boards, which are much more ruin heavy, larger pieces of terrain. Uh, how do you navigate an army of Lehman Russes and storm swords around modern terrain? So uh, guard vehicles are, are still deceptively fast. Um, 
where, you know, chimeras, you're looking at movement of 10, Lehman Russes, Andorns, movement 10, even the uh, Storm Sword is movement nine. And uh, they all have access to move, move, move. So just put plus three inches of movement. So I can load up a chimera full of guardsmen, move it 13 inches, and then they disembark for another three. So all of a sudden, I have guardsmen 16 inches across the board, right? Um, but with, I mean, especially like a storm sword, right? The thing's massive. I'm just dropping a shoe box on the table. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to navigate it around. Uh, so even with the changes to redeploys, it's redeploys are still really good. And the Lord Solar gives guard access to a redeploy three units, including putting things into strategic reserves, which I have played around with putting the Dorn or the Lehman Russ into strategic reserves and having one of those in your back line when you don't expect it, especially when it's rapid ingress, right? They yeah. Um, it all it's a massive pressure release valve if they are like a melee army or you know even tyranid something like that where all their big monsters are all coming straight up at you um but we'll get more specific into the match and talking part yeah. too I'm very curious also with the specifics to your actual list but just conceptually you know just bringing a lehman russ out out flanking it and driving lehman russes up the table it, it creates the pressure to scream from your opponent's side so that you don't just get destroyed by the thing that's coming out of reserve. And what you screen, you allow, you get closer to, you, to your opponents. They can like hit charges with your chimeras like you were talking about, or, um, you know, you can shoot those screens. So like resources, you're just killing them now. Um, when you play this aggressive style, there are other armies that aggress way scarier than, you know, guard, like, not getting too specific, though, like running straight at a Chaos Marine army or straight at an Orc army. That's got to be not what you should do with your Astro Militarum, right? Like, how do you play this style? So it actually depends, right? Um, because I like, I've played so, like, playing against, um, um, uh, like Corn or, uh, um, uh, wow, I'm having a brain fart here. Um, Peters? yes, thank you. Yeah, you know, yeah. I just kind of sit back because I know they have to come to me. Otherwise, they don't stand a chance because they don't have guns, right? But then I played against uh, uh, Space Wolves. I guess they count, right? And I'll just outflank a Dorm in their back line, and it's just too much for them to handle. Uh, but I have, depending on the the melee power of the army, if it, if they're still only wounding me on fives. Yeah, I'm still just going to proceed as planned, right? I'm going to be straight crazy. forward. You're really leaning into that toughness, like the fact that your vehicles are just so tough these days to just press forward regardless. Yes. Yep. Awesome. So I feel like we beat around the bush a little bit. We can't really progress this without going into your list. We usually say this for close to the end of the episode, but I, I, we're just so eager to talk about it. I am too. Like, let's get into it. Uh, Robert, what is the list you actually took to the Warzone format, Houston event? So uh, I ended up taking uh, Lord Solar. He's pretty much required for any guard list as it stands right now. A command squad with and Gaunt's Ghost, an engine seer, followed by two units of Cadian guardsmen, and then an infantry squad with a mortar. And then I got two Hellhounds, two Chimeras, the Storm Sword, Lehman Russ, the Dorn. And a Calidus Assassin probably should have my list up. I think that's it. Oh, and, uh, and one Five Man of Silence. Uh, five Man Silence, awesome. nice. Okay, so I, I'm not super privy to guard just based on stat lines. Walk me through the Storm Sword. What is this thing? So this thing is a T13 beast, two up armor, and uh, the engine seer can give it a four up invul in the command phase just for free. Right. And um, it has six plus D6 shots, blast, ignores cover, strength 16, minus four, two plus D6 damage at range 48. So it can really reach out and touch people. Uh, I've had to kill an entire 10 man of custodes by itself. Right. Because in addition to that big gun, it also has 15 twin linked heavy bolter shots and four last cans. And it just has the ability to go out there and alter the way people make decisions. 
is maybe they would go out and try to deal with two Lehman Russes, for instance, or maybe even a Lehman Russ and a Dorn. But the first time they get shot at by that thing, they just try They just ignore that section of the board. If they cross that firing lane, they just stay out of the way of it for the most part. You know, there are some people that actually do have the toughness to try to go out there. I'm mainly thinking so, of the Necrons on that one. But. Yeah, and like I said, we'll get into all those matches more specifically yeah. in part yeah. two. But right now, like you're really just leveraging the fact that it's so durable to just let that be the spearhead that drives your army forward. Yes. I mean, that is the centerpiece to my army. So nice. uh, if that dies turn one, it's still a game, but it, it'll be a lot more difficult. Yeah, no kidding. And the, the, the nice thing is there are so few armies that can really put out that kind of output to kill it turn one, especially like the way cover rules work right now. It starts with tulip save, I assume. It's, mm-hmm. it's tough. It's tough. So talk to me about Warzone Houston. Um, because I think that, you know, when you talk about guard without indirect fire, one of the things that comes to my mind in terms of how how it works is the type of terrain we play on. What was the terrain format at Warzone Houston? So I will say the terrain was beneficial for me. It was relatively open, uh, like uh, two giant uh, crates. Uh, They're probably about one foot by s- six inches tall. No, wow. uh, those, actually, those are huge. Yeah, no, they're massive. Uh, that sucks for combat armies. Wow. No, yeah, no, so yeah, they're they're yes. right there in the center. You have you each have one big set of ruins, and then another uh, set of ruins uh, like the elves. And then on day two, they alternated. So now the ruins are in the center, and then the big containers are off in the corners. Gotcha. So really just pushing the, the huge pieces in, in different locations. So one one would assume, like I would assume that having like some artillery, like a couple of basilisks, a couple of course, something like that, not too much, would just be good because you know you could hide something behind those big ruins, but not everything. And that screams artillery to me. And also to kill their unit behind their wall, you know, the, whatever they're, that's important back there. Um, but you, you've really just gone full aggro with everything. What was that consideration like? So I, I guess the way I was looking at it is if if I can kill them behind a wall, that's great. If they're not willing to come out from behind the wall because I will kill them, then they might as well be dead because they're ineffective in the game. Right? Yeah, and, you, and you're so confident in your durability and against most things that you don't mind that the, they get the first shot when they step out from behind the wall. Like, that's fine. Yeah, but, yeah I'm, unless it's a, another Baneblade chassis, yeah, I am very confident that it stays alive. Or a Thousand Suns taking away my armor. That's yeah, not that's, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll talk about that matchup for sure. Yeah. That's, that's a weird one. Okay, so it makes sense to me. Like you really, and then you're on the objectives, right? So if they're really just cowering behind walls, like you're scoring, who cares? And you're going tactical, like you said. So you're basically able to just um, draw cards, and as you take over the table, you just kind of score cards, pretty much. Yeah. So I just end up with crazy amounts of board control as people are sitting there trying to move stuff in a way to make sure that they uh, that I don't have a firing line, or and it just they, they end up playing way too cagey. Right. It sounds like it. So when all these things are considered, like your army's like a big aggro pressure army in disguise of being a gun line, which I think is really cool and interesting. Um, you're barely making use of reserves. You have one unit of scions. Are you do you ever consider putting more reserves in there or are you pretty happy with that? Uh, I actually do fairly regularly, depending on the opponent. I put hellhounds into strategic reserves uh, using my redeploy, right, from the Lord Solo. Uh, which allows me to do it for free and ignore the limit. I put the Dorn in strategic reserves, the Lehman Russ, the Hellhound into strategic reserves, just so I can end up rapid ingressing it in and uh, getting a really solid, tough pressure pressure release valve in uh, my opponent's back line. So I, I do try to utilize reserves fairly often. And then uh, it can be a little deceptive with how much I actually have for deep strike capability because I do have the one Scion unit, but Gaunt's Ghost at the end of my opponent's turn can go up and then deep strike in my reinforcement step. Yeah, and that's going to help so much with tactical objectives too. Oh, yeah. And they're they're, they're lone operatives, they're stealth, 
and there's six of them, right? And they're each two wounds apiece, gaunt being three. Um, and then got, I still got to take the Calidus, you know, the first inexplicably it got a points drop. So um, <laughs> sure did <laughs> whatever. Nice. So, so what, what are you, what are you actually concerned with in terms of matchups? So I had a guy, the next part of our conversation with this army. Uh, so thousand sons can still be tricky, right? Yeah. Uh, right, if they set up correctly and they're able to, uh, get out there and, you know, doom bolt lone ops, right. Or, um, be able to remove the save from some of my heavy hitters. All of a sudden, I just don't have as many tools to react to, uh, to what they're throwing at. me. And then the new, uh, tyranids actually, uh, with like the emissaries and, um, a lot of those big monsters with the four up in bolt, it's swinging. Right, I could easily kill them if they don't roll their four ups. Yeah, but if they make their four ups, uh, that's, that's kind of like it, you're accepting your guard life. You know, I was actually just talking to one of my coaching clients earlier who was having trouble with the guard match, and I was, I was talking about how guard don't have re rolls, and they don't have when when something doesn't work, their answer is fire the next tank. You know, like that's yeah. But until there is no more tanks, then they're just sad about it. Like, how do you deal with that as a player, right? Not having necessarily, not so literally no rerolls, but you have relatively poor ballistic skill. You have random shots a lot of the time. Like, things can just not work out. Sometimes your opponent can pass too many four saves. Sometimes you just die to two last cannons. You know, when you're playing these big models, the averages can get skewed because you're playing with so few dice. So, does that ever bite you in the butt here? How do you get through that? So uh, some of the averages end up working out a lot better than you might think with, you know, the take aim order, right? Uh, increase the ballistic skill by one. So the Lord Solar ends up uh, being able to issue orders 24 inches by attaching to an infantry unit with a command squad. So all of a sudden, all my tanks are hitting on threes base, right? And then the guard special... Ability is if they remain stationary, sixes also auto wound, right? So if if I find myself in a scenario where I got a big bug running at me, I shoot at it and it happens to make all of its saves, then the next turn, I'm just going to sit there because he's going to catch up to me anyway and just, okay, I'm going for sixes auto wound, hope for the best, right? If he makes it, he makes it, but at least he isn't further up into uh, my lines, and I still have a dead tank. Makes right? sense. This is actually, that's another point, which I completely forgot about. Astronaut Tim's rule is if they stand still, six to hit auto wound. And, you know, that literally peanut butter and jellies with the artillery sitting yeah. in the corner. Um, and it's so hard just to pass that up and, and even, like, like, I know when I think of guard, that's the first thing I think of, right? Like, they're going to sit in the corner in the artillery castle and just let's blow me up. And the fact that your style of being aggressive, moving, charging, that kind of thing, coming out of reserves, that you're not even playing with your faction rule in a lot of the time. How do you even approach the game so that you see it like that? Like, this seeing past your faction rule and saying this is a more effective way despite staying still. So I think about it, you know, like how the changes with a heavy rule. For instance, right? Often units with a heavy rule for their weapons, they have one point less of ballistic skill, right? Because the idea is you're running up, getting into position, and then you stay there, you get set up, and then you get plus one to hit. So I'm thinking about my faction rule functioning essentially the same way. So maybe the first turn or two, I'm really not getting to utilize uh, the sixes to hit auto wound very much until I push up enough and get enough board presence where I get all of the ideal firing lanes that I want with mutually supporting fire. Right. So now all of a sudden I can just sit there because I just control the board and anywhere they come out, all three tanks are mutually supporting each other. So no matter where you go, you're going to get shot at by at least two tanks. Right, with sixes auto wounded. Yeah, no, that sounds terrifying. No one wants that. So it really sounds like it's a, 
it's a kind of make the make don't make the use, use the rule every single turn. Make use of it once you've driven up to the objectives. And one, honestly, you literally shoot out of close combat into close combat. These things don't follow rules. So like, yeah, literally drive to the objectives and say you're done. Put yourself in park, get plus one to hit, and then six to hit or lethal. Just drive to the objectives first. It makes perfect sense when you put it so bluntly. And uh, is whenever I look at all of the units that are available to the guard. Right. I understand the appeal of artillery. It's I mean, you don't have to do anything. You just have to sit there and go, I want that thing dead. Right. But the guard codex has access to so many high strength, high AP, high damage weapons. Right. That you end up giving up to take that artillery to maybe plink off several wounds. If you win against knights, for instance, I mean, all your artillery is wounding on fives and you're really just hoping for sixes to auto wound. They're not going to kill somebody. A Lehman Russ, though, will absolutely nuke a knight, right? Strength 14 minus three D6 damage, three plus D6 shots, right? That's that's a lot of shots. And all of a sudden it's hitting on threes, right? And uh, so you can end up putting a huge hurt on people. By just taking advantage of the fact that a lot of people don't have high strength, high AP, high damage weapons anymore. I'm seeing like it. Does. Yeah, it's despite last kins getting better, you see less of them. It's always it's always so so interesting to me. Um, but yeah. I think this is this is a great place to leave it for now. Robert, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to talk about the actual matchups. I feel like that's what you're eager to, to get off your chest. We're going to unpack Thousand Suns, how we can try to make some plays there. We're going to go through those combat armies. We're going to go through the other shootier factions in the game, even the weird ones like Jeans Circle. Cult. So check us out in part two. That's on AOW40K.com. That's going to be for our subscribers where you get part two and access to our Discord server. It also really helps us keep producing the show. This is like our 207th episode, and I cannot do it without your support. So thank you all, everybody. Robert, I'll see you in part two. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, great. Thank you. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. Thank you.